I'd like to thank our top sponsors, Dean Anthony, Fergus Ryan, and Anders Berge Christensen for making this show possible. And welcome to the Cave of Apollos. Tonight we will look at the connection between social justice activism and critical theory, an intellectual product of the Frankfurter School. It is a story of what happens when objectivity is deemed an impressive tool and cultural relativism attacks the idea of a universal human condition. My guest is a writer who opposes political activism in places where it does not belong. Andreas Harag Olsen, welcome to the Cave of Hills. Thank you. So I think perhaps the, way the picture on the wall here is self-explanatory. We're talking about the complete collapse of civilization and you are here to tell us why it's happening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's pretty dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, is, uh, this is Thomas Cole. Um, I think it's a fairly famous um, painting by his. And uh, um, we've been thinking about it quite a lot here at the Cable Palace because, you know, uh, obviously anyone who has two eyes and some ears can understand that there's something specific going on culturally today and it has to do with the whole idea of wokeness and critical theory. Um, you, should we just start with why you became interested in, in these things, this subject? Yeah, I think, uh, I think I can pinpoint it pretty exact. Um, I was reading uh, the book uh, The Calling of the American Mind by uh, Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lubyanov, which is uh, a book that tries to explain why uh, we see the things we see at the American campuses. Right. Uh, the last 10 years. And with the, of course, the, the riots and, and the safe spaces and the talk about microaggressions and trigger warnings and all that. And um, their main thesis is that we are dealing with a, a generation that has been overprotected. And for the first time, they are uh, leaving the nest, they're leaving their parents protective wings and they are unequipped to deal with ideas that they don't like or agree with so their first time out of the nest is at a university and they don't see the university as uh, a place where you test your ideas where you wrestle intellectually with others they see universities and colleges as places that should be safe environments, of course, not, not just physically, but, but also intellectually. Mm. And um, they, also, uh, they also point their fingers to other explanations. And what caught my interest was that they were mentioning um, uh, Herbert Marcuse, who was a, a German Marxist and a, a, a professor at a university in, uh, in California. And he was also a member of what we today call uh, the Frankfurt School, uh, which was established in, in uh, 1923. And uh, he was, in the 60s, he was a leading figure, uh, both for the new political movement, the new left, but he was also uh, sort of like a godfather for the, the youth movement. And um, in, in uh, 1965, he wrote an essay called Repressive Tolerance, which has been highly influential, um, in which he argues that in an <clears throat> oppressive capitalist society, he was a Marxist, so that is a, the normal way to view the, the modern liberal democracies uh, in, in that tradition. Uh, Freedoms like uh, freedom of opinion, freedom of speech, uh, freedom of assembly are freedoms that are being used in a, a more like a totalitarian way in order for the ruling class to maintain the power structures. That's what Marcuse is, is yes, saying. Yes, yeah. that, is the, that is the idea of the essay. Mm. So he's that, he, he argues that since society is in a state of crisis or a state of emergency, 
uh, we must stop showing tolerance to the conservatives and the political right and only show tolerance to the left. And he also argues for censoring uh, images and texts that uphold what they call false consciousness. Yeah. And but that is not his term originally, or well, no, it's uh, it is a term that uh, was popularized by uh, the Frankfurt School, but it goes back to to Karl Marx and this idea of a uh, class consciousness, mm. which you have to have in order to uh, get the working class to carry out the revolution and to usher in the communist utopia. And the point that Haidt and Lukianov is making is that. A lot of those who were students in the 60s are today the professors and the leaders of the universities. Yeah, yes. So they are uh, very influenced by, especially Marcuse, uh, and a book he wrote, uh, One Dimensional Man, which came out around the same time as, as this essay. And, um, and, and they, they, <coughs> their, their point is that the universities has changed they, their telos, as Aristotle called it, the purpose, which used to be seeking truth, is now uh, equipping students in order to uh, make uh, social just uh, changes, changes in yeah. society. But is it, have I understood it correctly that it, what defines, well, because he's, he works within the Frankfurter School and, and critical theory, and what defines it, critical theory compared to so-called traditional theory, I guess Horkheimer calls it, is that the critical theory has as its purpose, what, no matter what, to change society. Not right. just to understand, but to change. Right. It's, it's actually... If, and of course, in the Marx, just <laughs> Marx yeah, sense, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Uh, because the, the 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 part about the revolution is 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 uh, crucial in in Marxist theory. If you ha if you see Marxists that want to work through the parliamentary system, they're they're not really Marxists. <laughs> uh, and the way we look at orthodox uh, science, in lack of a better term, is is that science is supposed to be or aspire to be uh, objective and neutral and uh, as, as a sociologist uh, Max Weber said it should be it should be value free, free of value, value judgment you should mm. present the facts but you don't judge the facts not normative yeah. right yeah. and, uh, and uh, the Frankfurt School is explicitly uh, different in its uh, critical theory um, in that you are supposed to make value judgments and the premise is that life is worth living or should be worth living and it's it's more it has more to do with uh, revealing how uh, different institutions in a liberal uh, democracy are in fact um, repressive and and uh, not uh, F f has nothing to do with, with freedom and tolerance, but since people have false consciousness, we don't really see society for what it is. Mm -hmm. We are, I, I think it was Marcuse who wrote that we are sick without wanting to be healthy. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, because I, I uh, looked through uh, repressive tolerance and I've heard, of course, well, um, you read this book too, and it's just, uh, whenever I have the chance, I always recommend it. Cynical Theories by James Lindsay and Helen Pluckrose. Um, where, where, yeah, this thing about false consciousness seems to be a really fundamental thing. You <coughs> think that you like something, but actually you don't. And right. there are people that know what you want and shall order you to, <laughs> to have those needs, right? Yes. And so, so that's when, if you are participating in the society, then you are perpetuating the, the, that society, and that is an oppressive society per definition, right? Yeah, especially in, especially yeah. in this, which uh, looks at the different uh, mutations of, of uh, postmodernism. Yeah. When it comes to the critical theory of the Frankfurt School, it has more to do with which just being in a sort of like a permanent state of 
false consciousness and not being truly happy because the the paradise on earth hasn't been realized mm. so um yeah i think that the 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 woke movement today are influenced by both this what helen pluckrose and james lindsay call cynical theories which are <clears throat> postmodern or varieties of original post- postmodern theories from the 60s and the critical theory that was developed by the Frankfurt School. Now the Frankfurt School is is pretty hard to define because it's it's so plural, it's so diverse, it's so many different thinkers. It's, it's, there, there are philosophers, literary critics, psychoanalysts. Um, but I think I think what and, and there are a lot of a lot, uh, are a lot of uh, interesting stuff to come out of the Frankfurt School, like uh, the stuff done by uh, the psychoanalyst Erich Fromm, Escape from Freedom, and stuff they have have on on alienation and critique of consumer society. But I think what combines them is this uh, <clears throat> this this idea that you should have a, a critical uh, approach to society that all philosophy should be critical, you shouldn't mm. confirm society, you should always be critical of it, because um, you, you, risk, you risk not uh, entering the communist stage. Mm-hmm. But that, this, this, this was the way Marx looked at it, is that society is evolving through laws, historic laws, that you go through uh, feudalism and capitalism and then you enter communism, but you risk being stuck in, in capitalism if you have a false consciousness because then you never realize that you are in fact being uh, treated as a commodity, that you are a slave of the machine, that you are not a free individual. So you uh, just kind keep of, on living. This kind of explains why um, communist hates nothing more than the worker because... <laughs> <laughs> because the work is sort of satisfied with having, you know, whatever he has. Yeah, 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 of yeah. course. And, and, and that is uh, interesting about Marcuse because he was, when, when he was uh, being this big figure among the students in the 60s, he was also attacked, of course, by the anti-communist conservatives. I think they even sent him death threats and he, he had to go into hiding. But he was also disliked by the orthodox leftists because they meant that he... Uh, was a traitor to the working class because he and, and the other thinkers uh, that are connected to uh, the the Frankfurt School saw that the, the working class actually are being complacent in a capitalist society because mm. it seems that workers are doing very well when when <laughs> when they're that, living in a, a capitalist society. <laughs> Shit, that got, that got, there goes that, the theory. Yes, and okay. that is why he saw the, mm. the new agents of change being the students. And not mm. the working class, so mm. he was seen as a as a traitor oh, to the working class. Okay, okay, huh? And and so uh, so w- where's the link then between? Well, I guess you touched upon it between the, so the wokeness going quite rampant now and critical th- uh, the critical theory the, or Frankfurt School. Is it like a well, it merges a little bit with postmodernism, or is it? Can you say that it is, it is pure critical theory somehow? I think it's. Uh, I mean, changing society. You had these concepts yes. of, of uh, having internalized whiteness, or internalized this or that, which means yeah. that you don't know what you really uh, are serving. Yes, I think. Yeah, I think that the the crucial point is this uh, this idea of a false consciousness, yeah. uh, which is uh, both evident in in the the critical theories that uh, Black Rose and Lindsay write about, but also in, in, uh, in, uh, in the critical uh, theory of the Frankfurt School. And uh, because the, 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 the Frankfurt School, they were not postmodernists. They were, they were, for example, they were very critical of, of uh, uh, popular culture which postmodernism embraced popular culture. Mm. But uh, Adorno, for example, he drew a very distinct line between high art and low art. And they, they saw that, the way they saw it is that you can, you can grasp reality if you can achieve this revolution at first and then you install the working class or whoever that might be uh, uh, as, as the as the new government and you will usher in communism 
um, um, I lost I lost my track. Yeah, no, but so so because um, I'm thinking about how you you hear all these buzzwords today that uh, seems to have a link back to the to the Frankfurt School the critical yeah. theory, and I was just wondering about what I mean all these things. What unites all of this uh, critical theory, postmodernism, wokeness, if you want to separate them, I guess is the idea that society has to be changed and this idea of the false consciousness, right? Yeah. That's the sort of the basic premise for all of these these uh, ideas. Yeah. And I think, uh, well, I think um, James Lindsay uh, talks about critical theory as a really strong industrial solvent. That it just dissolves whatever you, wherever you introduce it, it can dissolve anything. And I think it seems to be programmed to, f no matter what it is, to find a problem. Yes. And, uh, and it offers no hope. Yeah. Uh, th and that is explicitly uh, what Marcuse is saying, is that it has no solution. It offers no hope. It's just critical. Yeah. So you just criticize and criticize. So until the revolution the people, can happen. Yes, because yeah. then you will have uh, a people that is so dis dissatisfied with the society they're living in that they don't want, that, that they want to tear it down. Yeah. Um, so, uh, like, when you, you, you t talked about it just before you sat down, uh, traveling in America and seeing these sculptures or wanting to see some statues that were covered now. Yeah. And that is a direct consequence of, of Marcuse's ideas then. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, the, the, the toppling of the statues and... and uh, and all that stuff uh, plays into it. I think it's. Uh, uh, I think of it as a more like a, a Jacobin thing, mm -hmm. where you try to erase your past because you hate your past, and um, you want to start over again, just like era fascista in in Italy, where you started the timeline at the March of Rome and 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 after the the the, the French Revolution in seventeen eighty nine. We start the calendar starts from year zero again. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it looks like that is what happening now that people are are pushing for that you tear down the statues that you are getting rid of books and art which you probably know a lot better than I do and uh, and and f philosophers from curriculum uh, it, it's is a is a rebooting of society mm. it seems to me. Or an attempt, and th that's um, yeah, because that's a, that's one thing I see. There are so many similarities, uh, and when I th see what is going on generally in society, I just thought of that. Well, this is something we've seen within the art world now for the last for like uh, at least hundred years. I mean, I talked to to uh, Sebastian Salo about that, where I read in cynical theories, they talked about how. Uh, how um, or is it on uh, his podcast? Anyways, lowering the the level to enter the university because, of course, they are, they want equity, you know, meaning that equal outcome, not equal mm. opportunities. Mm. So the results shall be equal, and it turns out that the, they are saying that these uh, tests you have to pass create inequity. So they want to get rid of the tests, mm. apparently. And I thought about it that it's something that we've been living in within the art world now, yeah, for like 150 years. That you take away the demands for knowing a craft, yeah. So that because and then there is no objectivity, and you cannot s separate uh, good from bad. Mm. And of course, that always just helps what is uh, you know of worse quality, right? Mm. And I think that is a so. So there's a question then of of is that a direct, uh, or when you see that gen in general society, the breaking down of objectivity and this cultural relativism, is that a direct consequence of the Frankfurt School or is that some spe special woke idea? I don't know. I, I, I have always, I'm not an expert on, on uh, postmodern theories, but it seems to me more a, a postmodern thing. Yeah. Because... Uh, the, the Frankfurt School, or it's it's as I said, it's difficult to be very general when you speak of them because they are so different. 
but uh, or they differ from each other. Uh, but they were not. I I don't see them having this idea of uh, removing objective criteria within because the they are Marxist and they're for believe in some kind of yeah yeah truth. They, they believe it yes they believe in an objective okay. world. And that is where I lost my track earlier. That is the the, the postmodern theories has more to do with you being unable to grasp reality if reality even yeah. exists mm-hmm. an objective reality mm-hmm. you you only have this subjective reality that exists within the discourse while the frankfurt school definitely believed in in an objective reality which you can reach and always is there but you just have to make people aware of uh, how they are being repressed in the existing society because mm-hmm. they were uh, they they were they were critical of, of course, fascism, but they were also critical of, of the Russian Soviet communist type, uh, and they were also critical of the liberal democracies because they didn't really view them as democracies in any true shape or form. Mm. But but uh, I think that this 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 idea of eliminating standards in order to achieve equity is hasn't very much to do with the thinkers of the Frankfurt School. I see that more as a postmodern thing. Mm. Yeah, because that's about, the, I mean, that's where you get, uh, uh, this is where you have the situation, for example, now in the Scandinavian countries, in the, uh, the art academies, where they are, well, uh, the, is that a postmodern thing, or is it critical, th- more like critical theory? It sort of, in a way, merges together somewhere. But you, for example, in Denmark, you had this this art, uh, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, they did thing where they threw a a cast into the harbor. Yeah. Because of a king that under whose rule there had been slavery. Of course, not mentioning that uh, Scandinavian people have also been taken as slaves at the same time. <laughs> but mm, mm. So uh, they do that to, to demonstrate against that. And uh, of course, afterwards, it is defended by other professors and these things that talking about it as a part of some kind of conversation and, mm. and as a statement instead of as an act of violence. Mm. Is that a sort of the Marcusean way to see it because they're doing it against bad people, so then it's not uh, destructive or like... Um, because it, it seems more that's not postmodern in the sense that it's you know, who knows what is true or not but that is a clear agenda yeah, yeah, political yeah, yeah. agenda yeah uh, it's difficult to say uh, I think that Marcus uh, and people of his tradition would view it more as um, justified uh, kind of rioting before you have a general strike or revolution, but it's not mm-hmm. an act in itself that he's very uh, concerned with. Um, mm. There was actually a rift between Marcuse on one side and Horkheimer, Adorno, and Habermas on the other because. Marcuse, he was a he was staying in the U.S. where he became this leading figure, and he was chairing on the students in the '60s. But Adorno and Horkheimer, they viewed it totally different. They were actually warning about fascism from the left. So you have a very interesting correspondence of letter between uh, Adorno and and and, uh, and Marcuse about this, and he was. He was totally fine with Marcuse was totally fine with students taking over universities and, and all that stuff. And the other world were horrified by it. And Adorno he even had his uh, lectures uh, disturbed by uh, topless socialist students running around and disturbing in his classroom. And Habermas even had a lock on his door in order to prevent students from breaking in and making long distance <laughs> phone calls. Uh, so they were not very popular amongst the students. So Marcuse is a kind of different cat but uh i don't think he it's hard to say what he would f- say about uh, the statues in itself i think he would see it as as justified acts of people that are being um repressed in the society they're living in 
but what they were waiting for was the total revolution mm. and i didn't i don't think they really cared that much about no. what exactly happened with the past and the statues and, and stuff like that mm -hmm. but how um and i and i think that a lot of this also have to do with something as banal as kids being kids getting a, a kick out of being radical what is really disturbing is the intellectuals and the people in the academic community who is mm. chairing for it mm. what do you think then about um I mean, I, as far as I understood, you haven't been that much into uh, Antonin Gramsci, but it struck me uh, struck me as something that Lindsay, Lindsay is talking about, how apparently he is the one who understood that if you should have a, a political revolution, you have to start with the cultural revolution first and, and take over that area yeah. to weaken the culture and then the political revolution can come. So I'm just trying out some thoughts here. It seems like this woke uh, aggression, finding problems everywhere, is this uh, Gramscian cultural revolution so that you can have that political revolution later. Yeah. You think there's something... Yeah, it's, uh, I, I read some of his, uh, his prison notes and it's... Uh, it's it's for me it's a bit hard to know what to make of it, but you can interpret it in in a way that you are creating the revolution by going through the institutions. But the way I understood it is that you uh, seize these different institutions in order to 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 get rid of a false consciousness uh, and to to um, to make people more aware of what kind of society they're living in. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, well, <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a bit difficult, but 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 that is what it seems like. That the first interpretation is what you are really seeing now with publishing houses having staff members trying to cancel the books they're giving out. The last one by Jordan Peterson, for example, and mm. and now the book by Mike Pence, where people who work in the publishing house tries to cancel the books and. And, uh, yeah, that, and that seems like a Marcusian thing to do. Am I understanding it correctly? Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. definitely. Uh, especially, yeah, esp yeah. Uh, when you define them as conservatives having uh, dangerous thoughts being uh, disseminated, that is, <laughs> that is definitely a way to do it. <laughs> so yeah, he, he would probably chair for that. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and I think. Um, Th th but there's something, uh, there's something that that uh, struck me as, as quite ironic. You know, when you look at and this is just generally looking at the situation today, how objectivity is seen as uh, well. That's one thing: this white male Western construct. Mm. And uh, one thing is that, of course, it's it is surprisingly racist. <laughs> that they yes. are thinking like that. I yeah. mean, it's like you have the, the the North American history of African American. I always mix up that name. I can't pronounce it. Um, it's in New York, I think. They had this uh, brochure on, yeah. on whiteness or yeah, whatever, and it was being on time, being objective, uh, working hard, yeah, and all these things. Uh... And I think uh, so. So that's one thing that is if only one a certain you know skin color people can can do that can be precise <laughs> but but it it's uh, something that i think lindsay talked about somewhere that the absurd thing is that of course if you look at european or western history it's full of examples of of uh, uh, periods where there have been extreme pushback against this idea of reason and objectivity i mean look at the mi middle ages and look at what happened with the destruction of the classical world with the christians taking over and you know totalitarian regimes in, in later years, obviously. So it's it's uh, quite ironic that they they say they want to that they are against objectivity mm. because that's an oppressive thing, mm. and at the same time it's just another re revolution or another movement in Western society that pushes for the same mm. same thing, right? Mm. Because I'm, I'm interested. I don't know if you you have something to to, to say about that, because, but it really 
to me, thinking as a painter, looking at sort of culture in the stricter sense, it seems that this is a fundamental thing. If you really take away all objectivity, mm. then there's nothing left but nepotism. Mm. Yeah. One thing I've been concerned with, and I, I, you know, I make these comment videos, uh, you know, commenting on things going on in the in the uh, uh, culture world, and of course, that's really when I, you know, wherever you look, you find social justice or wokeness or critical theory, like all, all kinds of variations around this theme. So I, you yeah. have to read cynical theories or, or read Marcuse and, yeah. and read these things. Yeah, and. Um, uh, one thing, for example, I don't know what, what you uh, think about it, but um, as a classical figurative painter, of course, I'm thinking about the classical values. And I see these museums making exhibitions that are to prove that so modernist is the same as Rembrandt, so what Rembrandt would have done today, right? Oh, right so to yeah. update yeah. You know, Rembrandt, so, so to speak. And that seems to me to be sort of a a case of, of um, uh, what's that phrase, they talk about uh, epistemic justice or, or yeah, injustice. Like, like, I'm just epistemic trying to, justice, yes. Yeah, I'm trying to understand the, the way of thinking because, uh, stop me if I'm just making stuff up here, but it seems to me that that way of thinking is a way of viewing people that have been, you know, uh, a certain person has been impressed throughout the centuries, but now finally he will or she will be, get her rightful place, right? Mm. Um, and, um, well, actually, I think I came to think of it through what they talk about uh, in disability studies. This thing about uh, being disabled as something less desirable is an oppressive way of looking at it and you have to embrace it and, you know, find, it's just another way of being able, yes, right? Yes, yes. And I thought of it that, you know, you shouldn't ju judge the quality at exactly. All. You know, don't uh, give people who don't care the, the ability to hear again because that's uh, imperialistic. Um, but it, it struck me from a painter's point of view that uh, you know, if you think like that, or that's basically how the whole art world is thinking. You know, the Matisse or some modernist in the 16th century was oppressed, he wasn't allowed to paint, but now we un so suddenly understood him and, and uh, that it's not a bad painter, it's just good in a different way, right? No. <laughs> so it seems like, and because that, that's, that's what I, uh, I'm thinking about all the time, that these things that we are talking about in society specifically, within these institutions, like within math, and, and that you have to decolonialize math and all these things that sound absurd. Yeah. These are things that we have been experiencing in the art world for a long time, yeah. taking away objective criteria and bringing in justice and not looking at the actual product because this product is made by that person. Yeah, yeah. And therefore, it's better than this person because he has, has white skin or whatever. Because like, if you try to sort of be unwoke and just analyze these things now, <laughs> categorize, be, be you know, what is that, in epistemic violence, mm. <laughs> um, it seems like that is... So the, the the Marxist part of it, oppressed oppressor, right? That, yes. That's like the Marxist idea. Right. But then it, it uh, right. gets all kinds of funky... Yeah, yeah, that, that's a good point. And that is what also uh, Haidt and Lukianov wrote about in Calling of the American Mind. But they didn't write a whole lot about it, but that was some something that they, they noted about uh, the, the neo-Marxists, and that is that they are taking the same kind of thinking out of the economic sphere into the cultural sphere. So you don't have the capitalist and working class anymore. No, I didn't get that. That they took... They you, the the, the, the tra traditional way of thinking in Marxist theory yeah. is that you have classes, you have two classes in society. You have the capitalists and you have the proletariat. And they, they took this, this idea, this class antagonism, into the cultural sphere. Yeah, two op opposing forces. Right, right. Yeah. So now you have, uh, for example, men and women, then you have men being the capitalists oppressing yeah. uh, women. <laughs> the and they are fighting the, the, the yeah. freedom battle against men and white oppressing blacks. Or mm. So you just take the same kind of framework, yeah. but into different spheres. But <clears throat> for Marx, it was only about the economic stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, it with with uh, the Frankfurt School, it it entered the the cultural sphere. Yeah, and isn't that 
uh, again, this is something I, I think I have from Lindsay. Uh, to see if you if you agree that <clears throat> that what happens with, well, Gramsci seems uh, according to what Lindsay is saying at least seems to be a, a clear point. But that I think he also talks about the 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 Frankfurt School in general or critical theory in general. That what they understood was that <clears throat> people have this need for a, a sort of a, a metaphysical goal or like some kind of religious yearning, right? Uh, and that has to be filled through culture. And uh, because what I've, I see generally, it, it, which perhaps doesn't give too much, much hope in the cultural situation that we're in, is that people on the right, conservatives, uh, you know, libertarians, they, they are some way thinking purely Marxist. Yeah. Uh, maybe not conservatives, but but I would say that it definitely applies to libertarians. Mm. I also see the oh, because oh, I mean they're the only concerned about material. Yeah, they're, they're, they're so like the high yeah, libertari culture. libertarians are like the mirror image of a Marxist. Yeah, that's the because strangest. because the idea is that as soon as you have all the uh, the material world. Uh, all the material stuff in place, a night watchman state would be the case yeah. for a libertarian, yeah. then all the good stuff will follow. Then the culture will be... But but you have a lot of people in the conservative tradition like um, Burke or, or, or Willem Röpke or Michael Oakeshott, Roger Scruton, they were, they were not of that idea at all. They were very concerned with culture and you need to have a sound culture before you have a laissez faire economy mm -hmm. but it's a, it's a it's a striking similarity and it's it's a bit frustrating uh and, and i said i think that that is why libertarians for the last 10 years haven't really had that much interesting stuff to say because uh, they are they are fixated on this economic stuff yeah taxes and, and, and regulations while this is more a culture war we're, we're in now yeah, I mean, I think this uh, this is something we've been talking a lot about in the cave uh, of Palace. This, this, uh, how this woke idea gives you this idea not of, you know of cosmic justice. Well, like Tom, Thomas Sowell, I guess, is yeah. the one who you talked about. <laughs> yeah, talking that, about cosmic right. justice. Right? Yeah, and this comes also back around again to to what you said about the individualism. Then. Yeah, because I there's. Um, uh, of course, within art proper, we've been hit with this so hard already yeah. that if you know a craft with our objective criteria, then you are per definition stupid yeah. and on the lower low rank, right? Um, but I think, so as you can look at the art world, what has happened there and understand what will happen in the rest of society when this, if this is not stopped, because the situation is that anyone who, uh, or, or the individual loses the ability to establish himself as someone who doesn't have connections or is not of a fine family because there are, all the criteria are just being, being eradicated. Hmm. I think that's, and that's, that ties back to objectivity, which sort of destroys everything. Hmm. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And and when you don't when you don't have that, then the whole culture goes goes down the drain. Yes. But I mean, do you see? Yeah, if you can't be certain of anything, then no, no, no. Of course. And then then it's the, this the situation where the language always changes, and you have to be aware. You have to use your energy, knowing what words to use instead of actually creating something. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're walking through a minefield instead of producing something. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's. Um, but it's also a situation where I mean, coming back to this idea, what do the the, the social justice uh, people appeal to? This sort of fundamental, primal idea of some purpose in life. And I'm thinking of, you know, f from the point of view of classical culture, to use a you know a very general term. That, and speaking of John Stuart Mill, what what we lose by this. Mm. Is this idea where you see your life in a in a eternal perspective? I mean, that this is what the classic, so-called classical literature, the classics do, right? Mm. 
And, uh, and that has concerned me a lot, that these ideas are promoting this thing about only being in your time. Hmm. And from the point of view of someone who works with classical culture, that's, that's a catastrophe. Yeah. And also I think... Also I think and, and principles doesn't really matter. Yeah, exactly. And that is what you're seeing yeah. now. Is yeah. that people aren't being principled at all. Yeah. They're just working out of emotions. Yeah. Yeah. And then if you, if you remove then those, um, uh, uh, like the classics do, you remove that eternal perspective that you can see your life in. Yeah. Or to put it differently, they can remove that by questioning anything that is certain, like gender or uh, gender roles or uh, what is perceived as good or bad, mm. because then suddenly if you are painting that or writing about that, then you will fall prey to the, the social justice mob, mm. right? Mm. I think people can, can start to police themselves. Mm. Uh, but you, maybe you could just mention the books that you have here, because if you have some suggestions of things to read to understand more of this, yeah. I think that's what the audience really needs to... You ha because you have to understand these things uh, right. in this way that we were confronting. Yeah, the, the, the book, one of the books I, I brought was A Quest for Cosmic Justice by Thomas Sowell, which I said a little bit earlier. But there's an older book uh, by Friedrich Hayek, who was a yeah. political philosopher, uh, my favorite. And he wrote a book in 1973 called The Mirage of, of Social Justice. Uh -huh. And th this is a book where he he is so annoyed with the concept, and he tries to find out what what does it really mean. And each person he asks have a different explanation <laughs> for what it really is. <laughs> and he hopes that uh, no academic will use the concept when he has showed how hollow it is, because he says that criticizing social justice is like hitting into a void. There's yeah. nothing there. Because it's it's just a nice name you put on your cause to give it legitimacy. Yeah. So he is very concerned with um, with um, uh, justice, looking at justice as uh, as how the the rules of the game are designed and not the outcome. Yeah. Because you you if you are starting to to control the outcome. Of every process, then you need the totalitarian bureaucratic state. So he lays out the case for that in the Mir 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 Mirage of Social Justice. The Mirage of Social Justice. And there's a book I there's a book I didn't bring uh, that that I don't have because I have I don't have a physical copy of it. But it's it's called the Dialectic Imagination. Uh, it's a it's about the Frankfurt School. It's Thinker, is that the one by Martin J? Martin J. is a philosopher, and also he is, he is also very sympathetic to to the Frankfurt School, and he. he That's he, a good he, book he, to read, then. So oh yeah, yeah, definitely. It's yeah. not, and it's not, it's not biased in in one way or another. It's just just a very detailed and uh, and good introduction to what it is. Good. I'm getting that book because I need to read and know more about this. Yeah. Okay. Andreas, it's been really nice to have you here. And thanks for some really good tips. And uh, uh, we'll, I th well, we can link to some of those books in the description below so people know where to get it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'd also like to thank our top sponsors, Dean Anthony, Fergus Ryan, Anders Bagge Christensen, Alistair Blaine, Eric Lasky, Jared Fountain, Michael Irish, Sean Roberts and Stacey Evangelista, as well as our anonymous donors for making the show possible. Don't forget to head over to kopellas.com slash donate and check out the ways you can support our show and the benefits you get from doing so, for example, accessing our premium library. I'll see you next month. <laughs>